Welcome to another segment of Lore You Should Know. I am Greg Tito, and today I'm joined by Mr. Adam Lee. Hi, Adam. Hello. This is the segment where we dive into a little bit of Dungeons & Dragons lore for your edification and entertainment, but also perhaps for use in your game. And today we are going to talk around the lore behind some of the group patrons that appear in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. There's a lot of wonderful stuff in that book. Um, yeah. And I particularly love this feature because it gives a great framework for giving uh, or providing resources to your players. Um, and the worlds of Dungeons and Dragons, as well as your homebrew, have tons of ways for you to use these uh, for storytelling possibilities. And so uh, I thought it'd be fun for me and Adam to go through some of them. What do you think about that, Adam? I think that is awesome and excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really, um, no, this is a really fun section of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, and it has everything in it, literally. Um, but this is a really cool section because, like, if you have a DM, like, when I grew up, I had a DM that made everybody calculate each gold piece, platinum piece, copper piece, down to the, you know, right down to it. So we had to fight for every little bit. But if, if you're a DM that is sort of doesn't want to deal with that stuff, wants to kind of hand wave it, and also wants a great way to kick off an adventure or a campaign, the group patrons are like the one-two punch. It, it not only takes away all the sort of logistical problems that a party can have, like, I don't have enough money to buy my armor. We, we want to get from... Water deep to never winter, but you know it, it, we don't have the money for a, a rent a horse, um, all that stuff. Plus, um, how do you even kick off the campaign? It's like, well, we met in the tavern. Why are we here? What do we do? Do we know mm -hmm. each other? A group patron is a great way to just say, "This is why we're all here," and then that patron then says, "We're going to take care of money. We're going to take care of transportation. We're going to take care of why you're doing this." And uh, so it galvanizes the whole thing together and just kicks it off with a bang. So, um, so that's great. That. And then it's up to you, the DM, to choose sort of what uh, manner of uh, group patron that the party is dealing with. So in this case, uh, Tasha's gives you a bunch of awesome, basic, uh, generic starting points. Like you can have an academy approach you or one of the party members could be a member of an academy and say... Um, you know, my my particular wizardly uh, academy is is looking for unique monsters to collect and bring back to the academy to study. Like it's, or maybe the academy is like the Smithsonian. It's like we want rare gems and rocks, or we want bones of ancient monsters that have been you know buried in the in the sand, or however you know you want to say that. Um, you could have. Uh, uh, an academy that wants old ancient scrolls and sends you off into like a ruined temple, a legendary temple. Yeah. Um, so, you know, something like you know, like Candlekeep is a great place for like an academy. Um, you could also use a place like the Arcane Brotherhood with that, you know, a, a band of, you know, rough and tumble character wizards that are up in Luskin and that they, um, they, you know, are looking for a ghost ship that sank and had some ancient arcane uh, scroll on board or a wizard that had a magic item that's been lost. Yeah, so, I actually uh, ended up using uh, that for my Frostmating campaign with sweet. my daughters uh, and exactly that. I, I used the Arcane Brotherhood as a great <laughs> introduction yeah. and I used the Academy Group Patron as a way for kicking off the adventure so that they traveled from Luskin to uh, Bryn Shander in the Icewind Dale to search after the four who had gone before them from the Arcane oh, Brotherhood. Cool. Yeah. Uh, and it worked out it worked out wonderful. And then we were able to fill in um, other players who joined the campaign later as just yeah. other members of the Arcane Brotherhood who are, are also uh, doing the exact same thing. And it, it, it helped out a lot. Um, and you also were mentioned Candlekeep could be a great uh, academy uh, perhaps as well. Yeah, yeah. The neat thing about Candlekeep is, yeah, there's all kinds of stories that have gone on in there. So you could, you know, they could send you off to collect a book, a rare book that um, you know hasn't appeared for centuries, or that is, you know, rumored to have been, you know, used by some, you know, queen down, you know, far down in the southern part of the Sword Coast. Uh, yeah. So a lot of, a lot of fun now, things. 
Um, you now can also just be, before we move on from there, oh. I just want to make sure everyone knows Candle Keep Mysteries. Uh, oh yeah, it's coming out on March sixteenth, and so <laughs> it, you'd be even. Uh, more equipped to use that as perhaps your group patron, maybe use, using one of those adventures as an introductory part of um, your campaign. And then it's a jumping off point. And so you can tell any stories you want after that using uh, Candle Keep as an academy, uh, you know, throughout. Um, so, it's, uh, you know, I feel like that's even more available for, for dungeon masters who want to use the tools uh, that are in our more recent books here. Yeah, yeah. Something like Candle Keep, uh, Candle Keep Adventures is um, that's just such. I'm so excited for that product because it's it's got a little bit of everything, and it's also you know kind of setting Candle Keep as how you can use uh, a place like Candle Keep um, to tell pretty much infinite stories, and it's it's a great launching off, and, and it's full of awesome ideas. Um, of how to, to launch off a story, you know, that's set within a library. Um, and then I'm sure when people play through, you know, five or six of those stories, they're going to get ideas for, okay, let's say, um, you know, I go to like some place like the host tower of the arcane, or mm -hmm. um, maybe I go to um, a, a library, like I infiltrate into Thay and I go into one of the libraries of the red wizards or, um, you know, something like that, where it's like, oh, now I, I get how these things can work and I get all the different ways you can loop in, um, you know, just how to kick off a story in the most crazy, you know, strange way. You know, it's like yeah. it all starts with a book and then and then from there, just, you know, you go on to it do whatever. It belongs in a museum. You can really yeah. do that whole like uh, <laughs> yeah. relic finder, mm -hmm. uh, treasure hunter by using the Academy as well. Uh, yeah. That's, that's great. Now, Ancient Being is, is another example patron that is in uh, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Um, and, you know, there's there's tons of ancient beings in Dungeons & Dragons oh gosh, lore. Yeah. Um, but what are some that you might have thought of, Adam, that could be used as a patron for uh, any type of story that's out there? Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I, I recently wrote an article just about, you know, different ways of using monsters. And, and one of the things that, you know, kind of popped up was the the spell speak with dead and the idea that you can cast um speak with dead on a on a corpse and have it you know rise up and tell you something it could tell you you know a quest and give it give you a, a way to kind of operate that way or lead you to something that then connects you to an even more ancient being um, but you know laryl silverhand is an ancient being and uh you know mm. <clears throat> she could certainly uh, you know, have plenty of things for characters to do in the Sword Coast. Um, you could get approached by, like, speaking of Thay, you could get approached by one of the Zulkirs of Thay, mm. um, uh, especially like Zaz Tam, who's an, a lich and an ancient being, and, you know, could try to tempt you into, like, doing something for them. Um, you could also be approached by one of the High Elves, and that, you know, is, is you know, has some, you know, possible you know uh mission for you to accomplish or that you've got to stop an evil that is that is uh, you know kind of encroaching on one of their sacred sites um or it could be you know uh you know a, a warlock's patron that then contacts them and says hey you know I, I, I need i need you to do something for me this way and, and uh you know i have you know areas on the on the plane that um, where you can get your uh, information or you can get clues or hints or even like caches of treasure where it kind of can you know keep fueling the the party's endeavors so um yeah, yeah i like the uh um other planar beings you know whether it's mm -hmm. a fiend or a celestial being uh one of these ancient beings that you are dedicated to or the party is dedicated to um you know that just immediately you have like an idea of what the cosmology of mm -hmm. of your world is by ha bringing them in there and i feel like that's a great way to add storytelling while also giving benefits to your players yeah like using um a being like a celestial like a solar or a planetar um, traditionally celestials are kind of in sort of a look, like observe and report mode. Um, they're kind of the Star Trek prime directive in, in some ways where they're just, yeah. 
they're observing the material plane and they're, you know, writing down sort of what people are doing and how, how things are evolving. Um, but, you know, a solar might come to you in a, in a, to the party and say, look, there's, there's something that the celestial sort of hierarchy wants you to, to take care of, or there is a portal that is open and you need to close it because if it doesn't get closed, then it's going to tip the balance between good and evil. Um, or they might send you like, you know, sort of the, the theme of, um, you know, descent into Avernus, which was like, there's an imbalance in the blood war. Mm. And we need you to go down into the infernal realms and figure out a way to stop something, you know, like to defeat a, a demon or to, you know, close, like, you know, get a magic item out of the hands of evil. Um, so there's, there's a lot of fun if you, you know, enjoy that, like sort of extra plane or traveling back and forth. Uh, that would be really cool. A cool yeah, thing to do. especially at higher levels. Um, yeah. And the cool thing yeah. about the, I guess, even the, the lich fiend or, or, or celestial ancient being is that there's a hierarchy, right? There's, there's yeah. underlings underneath the, the grand one um, built into D&D lore that you could use as your contact. Uh, yeah. But here's a question for you because there's, there's two on this list that are, one's called the endless, which is basically would be a being uh, in a fantasy story that just doesn't die. Yeah. Uh, uh, or a primal manifestation. I like that idea of there being like, you know, the primal manifestation of love yeah. is, your, is, your, is your patron or something like that. But yeah. my question to you is like, what would be your, your main contact in that case uh, if, you were, if you were to do one of those? Um, because there isn't a built-in hierarchy of, of, of lesser beings to, to report to. So like who would be like the, the major domo of love? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I, I would be tempted to go in a humorous direction with that, like make the yeah. major domo love like this, you know, smooth talking llama, or you know, a, a, <laughs> like or like a, you know, this uh, an ostrich or a peacock or you know, but always um, a bird. <laughs> yeah, it would be fun. Yeah. <laughs> or a large <laughs> bipedal creature. Yeah, yeah, that that would be fun, and or or it could be a party member that gets sort of inhabit and inhabited with this thing. And then um, if like, you've got the player who's a really good role player, you know, say, you know, write them a note and say, or talk to them before the game and say, look, when I kind of go like that, you are now inhabited by the primal force of love. And here's the quest you want to give the players. Neat. And so that way you can have a real laugh when, you know, your, your, your friend all of a sudden now has to play this role through their, you know, like their, you know, offling rogue character, whatever they become like, you know, depending on what, even what embodiment of love it is, it could be, you know, the love of all creatures and it becomes very spiritual or it could become like, love, you know, like you know, <laughs> they, they become like uh, the most interesting man, you know, in the, in the world. That's awesome. Yeah. And then of course the dragon is, is great. You know, they're in, end up being antagonists in a lot of, mm campaigns but i love the idea of you know the party working for a dragon uh whether it's of uh, good intentions or evil ones um mm. i think that's I don't know, there's there's something really great about making um the dragons the star of your campaign not necessarily as an antagonist yeah i mean like you got a dragon like bahamut and mm -hmm. um or bahamut however you want to pronounce it but um that that dragon is sort of on the same kind of vibrational level is as like Laryl Silverhand in that Bahamut is, is looking for, you know, universal balance. Like Bahamut's not, um, he, and he's really into, you know, making sure that evil doesn't gain a big foothold. Um, yeah. maybe a bit more hands-on than Laryl is like Laryl's got water deep to, to deal with. And that's pretty much her plate is pretty full. Um, but Bahamut is, is always on the watch out for team at, to be released and you know there's always the cult of the dragon uh, you know that's trying to get her out of there and um so that's always a, a good patron to have for the party you know to to because you know of course being a you know a super dragon bahamut can shape shift and turn into a human form and so they can encounter bahamut in a oh, human yeah. form and uh you know talk with this sort of very you know beautiful you know, you know you know, character who's, who's giving them this information about, you know, there's, there's, you know, cult of the dragon activity and you, you know, here's, here's, you know, what we need you to do. And, and then Bahamut sort of takes, 
all the logistical problems of how to get from here to there. I mean, you can just go and you, boom, you teleport to somewhere else. And it could be fun like to make it a cross planar adventure. Like you need to go to some obscure plane, like maybe you go to limbo or something and you've got to deal with all the strange things that happen in limbo, but you've got to find this one object that has the power of limbo in it. And then you bring that then and you go down to another plane and use that item to sort of seal Tiamat into her, you know, her prison on, uh, on Avernus. So, um, yeah, dragons are always fun <laughs> and they're always like super high stakes. Like anytime, yeah. I mean, you know, you could, you could ramp it up to Tiamat level or you could put it in that there's just, um, you're approached by a, you know, an, elf, an ancient brass dragon. Who's like, Hey, there's an ancient red dragon. My, my old nemesis who is now starting to reemerge from you know her slumber and coming up out of the mountain and is demanding you know vengeance and it's like oh crap like we've got to deal with this <laughs> i love all that i love more metallic dragons that aren't bahamut i think is fantastic the bronze yeah. uh, and brass are my are my favorite because they can be mm -hmm. they can be quirky and weird and have some of that comic relief too uh, which yeah. is always fun copper dragons for sure too like yeah. they're you know they're tricksters and they're full of Full of, uh, full of sass. <laughs> the, uh, the aristocrat uh, example here in the uh, patrons is, you know, pretty standard. I mean, that's what you would think of as a, uh, a medieval lord or, or, or some type of yeah. um, more mundane uh, government figure. You mentioned Lateral Silverhand. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, any, any leader Mert. of... Yeah, Mert or uh, any leader of, uh, of of one of the um, city states in the Forgotten Realms would do well, as well as uh, in, in in places like Eberron, right? Yeah, I mean, I'd love to do something where you uh, have an aristocrat that is a disguised vampire, um, mm -hmm. that you know this this very uh, charismatic uh, figure is telling you like to do these things, and I'll give you all the money you need, and that's very tempting and you know, a lot of your players will be like, yes. And then some of your players will be like, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> this is, we're getting into, we're getting into cahoots with somebody who's uh, kind of sketch, but, um, and then to have that, that moral dilemma, you know, of like, do we accept this from this sort of, we we're, we're pretty sure this is a vampire, but, uh, and, and to play the vampire in a, in a sense of like, well, you know, I'm not, not this evil monster. I'm just, you know, getting things done on this, this plane. You've just got to do a few things for me. Yeah. Um, or have the reveal of that vampire thing happen mid campaign or, yeah. you know, something like that. That'd be great. It'd be like, oh, we've got this great person. You know, you build up kind of a rapport and a, and a yeah. loyalty to them, and then you realize that they've been uh, someone else the entire time. <laughs> uh, I, I think cool. that's fantastic. That's really fun. And that would be great for like, you know, you start off on first level and you don't have the magic power to like kind of detect that this, this, you know, person is really in magical disguise. And then only later, like you can kind of suspect it, but you're just like, hey, we're getting tons of money. He's teleporting us all over the, the planet. Like, this is great. And giving us a bunch of clues for quests and everything seems on the up and up. And then when you get to, you know, the level you need to be to, you know, detect good and evil or whatever. And then, or he, this vampire could have, you know, uh, you know, mind shielding or could have, you know, d d dispel magic aura around him. So you just, you're never able to tell. Um, and then, then all of a sudden you find out and it's, then you've got that moment that you're talking about, which is, which is awesome. It's like, yeah. holy crap, what do we do? <laughs> you know, and I love then that we're it, trying to subvert DM, that like already <laughs> too. Because you know, and it can also just be fun too to have an aristocrat that is on the up and up and is 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 your patron and maybe even yeah. you know uh, uh, perishes by the end of the campaign and then one of the player characters has to inherit their their holdings. You know, oh, yeah. like I feel like we could even do a little bit more of a uh, a, a nice succession story. Uh, oh, that's cool. Using the aristocrat too. Yeah, like it could be um, like say this aristocrat's kind of at the end of their life and, you know, say she, she like takes a liking to one of the player characters and is like, Grooming you know, them. you do the quest and then she, she dies and everybody's like, Oh, super sad. And then they read the will and it's like, Oh, you've just inherited this estate. You've been, or you inherited all these holdings. And, you know, maybe if you go to like first to fifth level with this, with this aristocrat patron, 
Mm-hmm. And then there's that moment where it's like, oh, you know, we, we can't do anything. It's like, and then then she dies. And then all of a sudden now the party is at fifth level and they have this estate and a headquarters and all this cool stuff. And then you also have this cool story of this, this uh, you know, like this transference, like they, they, you know, they bonded with one of the player characters or all of them. They could be like, hey, I'm leaving it up to you guys because you, um, you know, obviously are a force of good in the world and I want to support that. That's like sort of my my gift to uh Faerun, you know. I keep um, those adventures so then, adventuring. I know, right? And then, then you become the group patron. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's fun. Um, the next one here is Criminal Syndicate, and immediately the the Black Network or the Zentarum come yeah. to mind as the as the in world uh, of the Forgotten Realms kind of best analog here. But basically, any thieves guild or uh, yeah. organization that is, you know, working in, in in subterfuge could work for this. Yeah, I mean Xanathar, man, you can go Xanathar oh, yeah. and get all skullporty, you know, and get all snooping around down there. Um, and for sure, like if you wanted to like go over to the 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 magic realm, you could get to like uh, the Orjav, um, oh, right, and the, like the guilds of Ravnica, and you know the the Obsidat is this sort of ghost council of of ancestral sort of crime lords, and they uh, from their sort of astral plane. <laughs> You know, still pull the levers and the strings of the of the that Ravnica guild and run it. So, if you wanted to have a great, fun adventure in Ravnica, or just pull the Obsidian and the Orjav and just slap them in wherever you want in your campaign, um, and just use them. Maybe you could even change the name and just say that's this ghost council of you know these these crime bosses that are still holding on even after death. They're still holding on to their power and trying to find a way to manipulate. The material plane, which is uh, like a fun thing, um, yeah, you can you can run with that. And because um, of those, they have so many underlings in that criminal organization, so that you can work your way up, and you know you'll have contacts that will be, uh, you know, less along the line, uh, uh, you know, uh, not lieutenants of Xanathar or any yeah. of the, the thieves guild, but then you can work your way up. And I like that there's a kind of a progression uh, involved in um, this as well as, I mean, yeah. I, I, the ability to be able to offload some of your uh, downtime activities to some oh, fences right, within yeah. the criminal syndicate. I mean, mm-hmm. that is something that <laughs> would be of benefit to, to a lot of players that I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, you know, thinking about just what you said about like, you know, there is this sort of hierarchy of a criminal organization where you're just kind of a, you know, a bag man at first and you're just running, you know, you're just moving things from packages. You're like, what's in the package? Don't ask questions, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you just move the package, you know, like, okay. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, you guys did really good. Um, you know, you, you've, you've been loyal. You haven't asked, you haven't been snooping around. Okay. Now we're going to give you the next thing. And it's like, wow. And we just, you know, and, and of course the lure is, you know, money, you know, it's, it's always like, Hey, we don't have to think about armor. We get the coolest weapons. Like, uh, that, that's great. And, uh, and then at some point, you know, the paladin of the party's like, okay, <laughs> wait a minute. This Hold is all up. sketchy. Hold yeah. up. Right. And the bard's like, this is awesome. Let's do it some more. <laughs> <laughs> the guild, uh, example here is, is kind of a catch all. Uh, but I love yeah. that there's some, some commercial thing. One of my favorite characters from, from when I was a kid was silk from the Belgariad. Uh, who was, oh, he was an adventurer. Gosh, he was doing all man, kinds of yeah. things uh, that were, were part of the, the, the heroic party. But he also was making deals on the side. No matter where <laughs> he went, he was always buying low and selling high. <laughs> and I think that yeah. would be perfect for, for uh, a patron in, in, in this guild system. Yeah, yeah, that is, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I mean, and in guilds, you know, they are everywhere and they can be everything. Like you've got guilds in Ravnica, you've got guilds in Eberron, you've got guilds and, you know, for sure you've got guilds in FR, you know, bazillions of them. And, uh, you know, even in Waterdeep, you've got tons of guilds. So just within just that city, you've yeah. got, you know, so yeah, it's, it's that, that's kind of sky's the limit. And, uh, I think, you know, um, we were just uh, like thinking about like the dragon mark houses, you know, it's like, okay, you can, you can do work for them. 
Um, especially, you know, like there's a lot of you know, lost lore in the, where the, the, the lost, the, the last war took place and mm-hmm. in the Mornlands, And there's just all this sort of mystery of like things. There were amazing things that were there. There were amazing um, constructs and there were amazing magic items and there were amazing, you know, machines that happened there. And there was a lot of lost technology and, so just these dragon marked houses sending you into that place to go and, you know, money is no object like house Kenneth just like saying, here's a ton of cash. Here's all this, here's all these weapons and all this, uh, you know, armor and, and just go for it. Just go get stuff. And that could be pretty much how, you know, a DM could start an Eberron campaign. It's just uh, a house, you know, hires the party and just like go get little things and bring them back. And you just start bringing back bigger and bigger stuff. And as you ramp up in power, then you're like, you know, you get to this level and then they're like, okay, there was a Colossus that was built and it fell. And now we need to get it back. We need to get, you know, it's docents out of its head. You know, it's like, we need all that technology back and all that information. And then you've got to go and try to do that big epic quest, which would be fun. And that could be, you know, that could be months of total Eberron fun. (laughs) Yeah. And I would totally (laughs) pay uh, House Canada has a as a, as a guild, right? Because they have a, yeah. a lot of uh, mercantile uh, expertise uh, thrown oh, yeah. out. Yeah, that's all about making money. And so, yeah, uh, n- not that all guilds need to have that, but there is there is that kind of unified purpose around yeah. uh, a guild, whether they be yeah. um, ones that are about craftsmanship or anything like that. Like you know, you're always about commerce to a certain extent. So, yeah. That that works out really well uh, from the Dragon Mark houses because they are they go across, you know, military control lines. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The next one though is military force, and that you know is is full on the wares the soldiers and and uh, the other those of those backgrounds would uh, would want to be in. Um, you know, I'm thinking of uh, perhaps even like the Purple Dragon Warriors from mm-hmm. from Cormier. Mm-hmm. That type of thing oh, yeah. would be a military force, right? Yeah. And, you know, when I think about that, like I think about even, you know, like the Purple Dragon Warriors or, you know, the Hell Riders and Elthrell kind of deal right. where you've got, uh, you know, devil fighters and fiend fighters and or you could pick like a, a long ship full of, uh, you know, ragged barbarians that are going to go down or um, or Illuskans, you know, that that these sort of Viking archetypes are going to take, they're, they're going to go sail, you know, the river sticks and fight fiends and go to Valhalla kind of deal. Um, it, and Or you could kind of do it where you're doing sort of like your party is a small tactical strike force. Like the main yeah. fight is going over, like say you're going to do a Dragonlance adventure and you've got like all these dragon riders and stuff in this giant, Arm, this battle's going here, but as a DM, you're like, I don't want to do mass combat. I don't want to deal with that, but I'm going to send them around here. And it's like, they're going to go behind the lines and they're going to infiltrate in and they're going to be a part of this massive battle, but they're the ones who are chosen to do this super dangerous, you know, high risk, but high reward job. And in order to do that, they get some really cool magic items and, you know, the, the trust, like if you pull this off, then these 10,000 warriors will survive. But if you don't, like the battle is lost and, you know, the, the evil dragon wins or something. So yeah, um, that could be fun. And I think what's, imp- I mean, all those uh, story hooks that you were just describing makes total sense. I think what's might be important for running a group patron like this is to make sure that there is some iconography, you know, as well as the, the badges of, of, of rank, uh, and whatnot, yeah. and kind of keep that mm-hmm. pomp and circumstance. Cause I feel like, I mean, maybe That's I'm, I, I've never been involved in the military, but I observe what happens in the military. Mm-hmm. And there does seem to be this level of ceremony and, uh, that can be very fun to play for, uh, a specific, you know, yeah. uh, player character or a, 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 a group to be like, oh, we're, we're this, you know, elite team within this elite team, uh, but we hold all yeah. of the uh, the things to be uh, important along the way. And I feel like that, you know, as long as you have that chain of command going, you know, it's, it's, it can be really cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and, you know, to like, I mean, everybody loves the medal ceremony at the end of Star Wars, you know. Yeah. Like that, the thing that as you start off lower level, 
you know, you, you do your mission, you come back and, you know, you get your reward or whatever. But then at some point, the, the, the military force, the patron, um, the, the general or the admiral or whoever comes down and, and she gives you a medal and is just like, this is your first medal. Like you've actually, now you're within the, you know, the, the, the military order now you like, now you're a part of this, this crew. And, and then there's that feeling of like, yeah, we're on, you know, we're, we're part of something. We're part of, you know, something that is, you know, and if the case is in your campaign, it's like this is military order is about defeating evil. And it's say it's something like the hell riders where, <clears throat> yeah, we are, we are the stand on the material plane to defeat the encroachment of fiends into this world and nothing's getting by us. And to reach, you know, to receive a cool insignia like that you are a, a, a devil fighter or that you, um, you know, you have gone down. It's like, say, if you go down into the, into Avernus and you come back, then you get the, the order of, you know, the, the Avernal fighters or whatever. And that's sweet. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. get the badge or the hell riders from, uh, yeah. from Beetle and Grimm's, um, yeah. <laughs> right. This, this type of thing I think is, uh, a really great way for a dungeon master. It doesn't have to be, you know, a physical item, but as long as you're yeah. you're, you're showing these uh, tokens of their service, um, you're right. That metal ceremony is great. Um, yeah, uh, a great example that 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 I think players latch onto and would love. And we, you know, I mean, dungeon masters can use that without using the group patron, but it just kind of yeah. adds to the the illusion that you are in this organization. Uh, and uh, are are participating, and then you get rewards uh, based on that. And yeah, matter. like DMs, you know, a lot of DMs have some artistic talent, you know, and they could draw their own cool insignia oh, yeah. of this, you know, fictitious order. Um, or they could pull one off the internet, you know, something like, you know, uh, but, or even, you know, a lot of the FR, you know, groups have little labels like the Flaming Fist has their, you know, their symbol. And you could do that and print them out and cut them out and then give them to your players, you know, like mounted onto cardboard, kind of like glue the paper on the <laughs> And then, you know, hand it out. It's got, it kind of has a little bit of feel to it. Like, you're like, oh, this is a really cool thing. And, and then have the, you know, have the, the ceremony. I, I think that's a great idea, Greg. That's really, that's really sweet. I want to do that now. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I want, I want to receive the medal, you know. Like, <laughs> I know, like, I have all my old character sheets and I have drawn on the back, like, little cool things that they got. And I think, man, just sticking, like, you know, the medal that they got on there would be just sweet. That is awesome. Um, so religious orders are certainly, uh, you know, they have, they have some similarities to what we're talking about, but they have this more devout thought, uh, going on around them, uh, philosophically. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what would be some examples of a religious order, uh, that you could use as a group, group patron? You, yeah. Like an FR, you could definitely use like, um, like, uh, you could be a, like an order of clerics that are worshipped or modern. And they are about going into battlefields and healing, um, you know, fallen warriors. They could also be, um, you know, trying to get the sick off the battlefield or going into a plague zone or going into an area where people have been afflicted by some fiendish, like, uh, disease or something. And, you know, just doing the good work of Ilmater. Uh, and then trying to find a way to cure that disease. Um, that could be, now that I'm thinking about it, it could be an interesting way of um, having a non-combat uh, adventure oh. where you're really kind of just solving a mystery and then you're you're kind of working against the clock and you're trying to figure out, it's almost like an episode of House or <laughs> ER, you know, <laughs> like, like something's happening and you've got to try to figure out what it is and your your enemy is the clock your enemy is this ticking like time bomb that's going to go off um and and ilmater is you know the the clerics have hired you it could also be that like uh, a devout organization is like we have a sacred person who is a super healer and we need to, uh, you to escort them from point a to point b and they've got to go through this horrible place to do their work and you've got to protect them from all the things that are going on um, that could be fun. Yeah, as but, well as yeah. making sure you're staying true to the tenets of the of the date, yeah. right? So, like, I lied. Like, your non combat idea is very cool. If you have a pacifist deity or something like that that mm -hmm. wants to uh, preserve balance, uh, you know, and and trying to figure out non combat solutions uh, through the encouragement of that through a religious order is very cool. 
Um, you know, there's less of the pomp. Well, I guess that's not true. There, there certainly will be some ceremony with some religious orders, but you know, yeah. there are ways that you can get that across um, just by being a friar and wearing robes and and, and yeah, that kind or, of or it could be devotion. yeah, you like you save the village, and then at the end, these humble people that don't have two pennies to rub together, but they they reward you with like hospitality and and you know pure of heart you know felt goodness you know and yeah and you've saved this village and they're like anytime you come here you've got a home and you know when you walk into that village you know people like you know they're they're like you're the you're the heroes in that in that village and that that really is sort of like a, a metal ceremony in its own sort of way that you know you've done something that's actually you know has impacted this this area of the forgotten realms you know you've 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 saved a village from fiendish disease of darkness <laughs> so yeah and then finally we've got sovereigns who you know are are how would you separate the sovereign um example here from the aristocrat example from earlier yeah i think like aristocrats kind of they're you know they're 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 sovereign aid like, but I think a sovereign could be like in the, in the uh, Tasha's book, there's the picture of the Triton King. Yeah. Who's looking all like swanky, you know, and he's got his cool crown on and stuff. And yeah, you could be approached by the King of the Tritons and uh, that you have to do some land based mission uh, to, you know, whatever that might be. Um, um, or, like a king of the 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 fa a fairy domain, like a fae domain, mm. and then they from the fae wild, and this this king of this fae domain approaches you and says, you know, hey, there's something you've got to do for my people down here, or like, you know, the thing that's coming to my mind right now is that there is a door in the fae wild that can only be breached by non fae. You know, if you've got a party of non, there's no no elves in there and there's not fair or gnomes, then you, you could have that party and say like, look, there's this thing that these monsters are coming out of this portal, but Fey are not able to go through it. It's warded. So this, this king of the face says, my domain is being invaded and I am coming to you guys for help. You know, you've been a, a friend of the Fey or, you know, however that, that you make that connection, but then you go into the Fey wild and then you go into this place and maybe it's the underdark, maybe it leads to the underdark and maybe it leads to, you know, some other, you know, realm. It could be a pocket domain or, you know, so, but. Oh yeah. That's a nice way to do it. So it's, you're not necessarily a sovereign or you're not serving a sovereign necessarily in the, on the material plane, but you're doing so, yeah. uh, through, through other means. Um, but I think, I guess in my mind, I think, you know, the different from the aristocrat is someone who's like a, the leader of a house or someone who's not necessarily, uh, the top dog in their yeah. area or in their city, mm -hmm. but still in the upper echelon where the sovereign is, you are serving the the leader. You're serving yeah. the, the king or the queen uh, and are uh, more directly responsible for uh, for that than you would be if you were just serving the, the, the aristocrat. Yeah. And, you know, like with the, with the sovereign, it's like you could do a pure and good sovereign, like something out of a, a, a fairy tale, or you could yeah, do like King Arthur or something. Yeah. You know, somebody who's you know really got ideal, high ideals and is, is pure spirit and heart. Uh, or you could do, you know, like a Henry the eighth sovereign where they're like, Whoa, man, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like this guy is, you know, this is kind of sketchy and he's, he's killing people left and right. And, you know, like, and if we get, <clears throat> it's a little bit sort of like a crime boss, like we can get a lot of big rewards by serving the sovereign. But if we make him or her mad, then mm. like we can, you know, get killed. So it could be like the queen of hearts in, um, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland, like she's all happy, happy, happy until something makes her mad. And then she just wants everybody's head chopped off, you know? So you could set up a sovereign like that, where it's just like, oh, you know, we at first it looked all great, and then now that we're in, we're in the deal with with the sovereign. Now, now we have to deal with their wild temperament, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, exactly. I feel like it's a much more personal, uh, personality driven uh, kind of way to do it for the for the sovereign for sure. Yeah, yeah. That's, so yeah, many that's, great things. I feel like you and I uh, could could throw ideas back oh and gosh. forth uh, forever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I would hope we were an inspiration to you and uh, can use these group patrons in a way in your campaign 
that brings forth all these stories and, uh, you know, cements them into reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the cool thing is that the, the, the Tasha's book gives you a, a framework to follow. Like you, you've got this sort of pattern that um, you can start to fill out. And it says, you know, like, what is the, the type of, you know, group patron, you know, what's their, you know, what's their, what a context do you, do you get? And what's the, what quests do they give? And so, you know, you can, you can read the section and then sort of get the ideas for your own, you know, your own group patrons. And so it's a really fun uh, section of the book to kind of explore and peruse and get ideas. Right. And it's not cut and dry. Like even just in how we're talking about, there's some that could fit for different ones and change throughout. And so it's uh, it's a super cool tool and I hope more people check it out and use yeah. it. Um, if people want to throw ideas at you, Adam, what's a great way to get in touch? Um, I am on the Twitters and it's at Adam of Adventure. So, yep, I'm always on standby <laughs> to hear cool stuff. Awesome. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Adam, for stopping by and talking through all this and we'll be back with some more fun stuff coming up. Sweet. That was awesome, Greg. Thanks. Yay.